Yeah, welcome to the Racer X Exhaust Podcast brought to you by Yoshimura with over six decades of four-stroke performance for your bike or quad. 2019 systems are shipping for all the new models, including the KTM and Husqvarna brands. I love this. Ready? If you're serious, it's Yoshimura. Check out the new website, Yoshimura-RD.com. Yes, a new website for them. We don't ever really fully redesign the Racer X Online website any longer because anytime you do that, people then say, oh, I like the old one better because that's what they've been used to for like the last seven years. And of course, day one of the new thing seems confusing. Also, everyone says they want website designs to be clean, just like they like all their gear designs to be clean. I, I think people just need to make gear that's just blank white, just clean. That's the word everyone uses for websites and for gear. So we never fully redesigned the RacerX site. Behind the scenes, haha, tricked you. We actually change it quite a bit with small tweaks here and there. And then if you add that up and look at the site over, say, a two or three year span, it actually is totally different. But we just do it slowly so you don't notice and we don't have to deal with your complaints. Like that? Now, we also dealt with your complaints on the digital edition of the magazine, which was not very easy to read. Here's why. Because magazines are horizontal. They're two pages. They are wider than they are tall. But your phone is designed to scroll vertically because it is narrower than it is tall. So what we have done now is completely revamped the digital edition of the magazine where it is designed to scroll up and down on your phone just like Instagram, just like Twitter, just like Facebook, just like most websites. So it is a lot easier now to read all the things that we worked so hard to put into the magazine on your phone. So digital.racerxonline is the place to do it. We're letting you look at it for free, even if you're not a subscriber. And we're going to highlight two of the stories that just came out in the new issue right now, today, on April 3rd. First, I talked to my buddy Brett Smith, or as I know him, BJ Smith, or the Beach, about the most expensive photo in motocross history when a random fan, basically, in the stands took a Ricky Carmichael photo that somehow, someway, ended up on some desks at Oakley and then ended up becoming a billboard outside of Los Angeles. And then what the photographer did when he found this out. That's our first story. Then I ring up Davey Coombs, who penned a update on Brock Tickle and his drug testing situation in the new issue, and Davey and I will talk about drug testing and where we are with it in the sport right now. This is like a never-ending topic uh, between Davey and I on this podcast. But first, this. Podcast. Pod, podcast. Podcast. Podcast, 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 pod, pod, podcast. Yeah, how about that? Now, since you all love the podcast song so much, maybe, maybe it's time for a live world tour. So we're going to do it. Friday night before the Denver Supercross in Denver. Friday night before the New Jersey Supercross in New Jersey. Friday night before the Vegas Supercross in Vegas. We will have a live show with myself, Steve Mathis, Jason Thomas. we got a lot of cool guests lined up. So come join us. Go to the Pulp MX site. You can find info on how to get tickets for these events. Just come. Just hang out with us. We'll be bench racing. We'll tell all the inside jokes that you love from our podcast and Pulp MX and all that. And then maybe I'll even sing the podcast song because I know you want to hear it. So come check that out. Also check out Supercross Futures. A couple of rounds left this weekend in Nashville. They'll race in Denver and also at Sam Boyd Stadium May 5th. And then again, tied in October 20, 20th and 21st, along with the Monster Energy Cup. So go to supercrosslive.com, and then you'll see Supercross Futures as a link in the upper right to get more information on that. They've got classes for kids. They've got classes for vets. And of course, your riders who are trying to earn their points to race professional Supercross. So it's a really great opportunity to just brag to your friends and say you once competed in one of these big arenas, whether you're a football player, or a motocross rider, it doesn't matter. It's still something to brag about at parties. That's really what it's all about. And one other thing to mention, just announced Ryan Dungey bringing his charity run at uh, Millville, back to the Millville National Weekend. There was a little bit of an experiment last year where he actually had his big St. Jude's charity ride after the Millville National, like the weekend after last year, they were trying to get a wider group of non-moto people, and they thought that'd be a better date. They brought it back now to where it's actually going to be part of the National Weekend again. So Sunday morning after the Millville uh, Spring Creek National, that'll be July 21st, 2019. Join us. Yeah, I'm doing it, man. A 5K run. Pff, I got this. 
And Ryan Dungey, and I'm sure a lot of other industry insiders, riders, racers, it'll be a cool opportunity for you to rub elbows and also raise some money for St. Jude. Speaking of that, St. Jude, a huge event at their hospital in Nashville tomorrow on Thursday, tying into Supercross. So huge, huge, huge props to uh, St. Jude, which really is taking care of the worst thing ever, which is children that have cancer basically allows them to get cancer treatment for $0 to the family because families need to worry about the kids getting better, not paying uh, prolific hospital bills. So Ryan Dungey, thank you for bringing that to the sport. And then thanks to the folks at uh, Supercross for embracing it hardcore and now bringing all the riders on board. But the real question now in Supercross, are all the riders on board with each other? Finally, the dam has burst. Marvin Muskan, Cooper Webb, teammates, training partners, all that, despite some checkered history, where Cooper was, I mean, doing anything he could to get inside Marvin's head when they were 250 competitors years and years ago. Well, it all flared back up over the weekend in Houston. Marvin put two non-distinct, normal, not overly aggressive Supercross block passes on Webb early to try to get in front of him in the first of the Triple Crown mains, and Webb went nuts. He snapped. He wasn't having it. He also knows that Marvin is closing in on him in the series. He needed to make things happen. So between the anger and the, hey, I need to beat this guy, Cooper rode awesome. It was probably the best we've seen Cooper ride in a couple of weeks. Marvin could not get away from him. Cooper hit him not once, not twice, but three times. And the third time, he finally accomplished what he wanted. He pushed Marvin off the track. Now, this, of course, has been discussed hardcore for the last five days since the race night because... Anytime there's contact on the track, there will always be talk. And the talk will always, always go two directions. Direction number one, why do guys have to ride like that? That's garbage. That's dirty. That's ridiculous. Argument number two, Bob Hanna would have done it all the time. These guys need to talk to Bob Hanna. Let's go Bob Hanna at the races. Bob Hanna needs to sit these guys down. This is normal. This is what Hanna would have done. So that's it. Jeremy McGrath rode clean. Bob Hanna apparently took people out every week. Two different ways to accomplish greatness in the sport. That's why you will never, ever, ever solve this riddle of uh, is contact with racing cool or not. Personally, I like it. I think it's exciting. By the way, the amount of times that riders get hurt doing this kind of thing is exceedingly rare. All right, go ahead. Tyler Bauer has got his leg broken by Justin Barsha last year in Vegas. You got one. I can give you like 97 incidents per year in LCQs that result in zero injuries, okay? So don't say this type of racing is dangerous. It's actually less dangerous than almost any other part of Supercross. Whoops, jumps, starts, way more injuries come out of that than this type of racing. I don't mind it. I think it's exciting. I don't think Webb did anything ridiculously out of line. But if you're Marvin Muscan, you're not going to like it. And if you're the team, you're not going to like it. A, shouldn't be pushing your teammate off the track. And B, KTM doesn't want Marvin, or sorry, Webb to ride that way. Not just with Marvin, but with anyone. They are of the mind that when you start it, it's just going to escalate. And ultimately, it's going to harm your results one way or another. Either you're going to get knocked down, and that's going to screw you. Or or you're just going to be so focused on getting each other back, you're going to ride slower. And I can guarantee you that after that race... Yeah, good job, Webb. He did beat Marvin and gained some points on him. But after that first race, Ken Roxon won it, and I guarantee you they were in Cooper's face and in his ear saying, yeah, good job. You battled Marvin, and Ken Roxon won that first main event. Now, were they going to beat Roxon in that race anyway? I really don't think so. But that's not the point. They've got the leverage to tell their riders, we told you not to do this, and in the race where you did it, a guy in a Honda won. How do I know this? Because a month ago, I wrote a story in RacerX on Cooper Webb, and I had literally those exact things told to me by both Roger DeCoster and Webb's mechanic, Carlos Rivera. DeCoster said, one thing we've had to try to teach Cooper is Supercross is tight racing. Sometimes there's contact. It's not with evil intent. You don't need to go nuts on the guy to get revenge. It's not personal. It's just part of racing. We want him to calm down and not react that way anymore. That's exactly what happened. Marvin wasn't trying to punt him. Marvin was just trying to pass him, and Cooper got mad. And then I asked Rivera about it, and he's like, look, I worked with Millsaps and Dungey. They never got into it with people. I always told them not to get into it with people because it always escalates, and it never ends well. You're going to ride slower. You're going to be more focused on him. Maybe you get knocked down. Maybe you knock him down. Either way, once you're focused on rivalry and getting people back, you're not focused on riding as fast as you can. 
So I know that uh, to team, this is the thing they've been trying to teach Cooper. But by the way, they could teach all they want. Did Cooper win the race overall? Did he add three points to his lead over Marvin on Saturday night? He did. Like I said, I've got no problem with it. It was actually effective. But I just don't think that Cooper's bosses see it that way. But it was exciting to get a little bit of that. I wish it went on all the time. But I bet you this is the end of it. Maybe Marvin's going to be mad. Now, by the way, one of the arguments I'm hearing all the time is, oh, Marvin's mad about being like, slightly nudged off the track, but he's cool with just completely cleaning out Tomac for a win last year. Yeah, that's how racing works, dude. That's how racing works. If you're Marvin, you're going to say it's different. Last lap of the main event, I was just trying to pass him. My intent wasn't necessarily to knock him down. That's just what happened. He didn't see me. He didn't know what line I was going to be in. I was just trying to pass him. Whereas Webb, A, their teammates and training partners, maybe they should be nicer to each other. And also... Even though Webb didn't hit Marvin as hard as Marvin hit Tomac last year, I have no doubts that Webb was trying to send a message. Marvin wasn't trying to send a message. He was just trying to make a pass on the last lap, and it was a desperate pass. And it went, I mean, well enough to get the win, but it it was harsh. So I think it's just different circumstances. I don't, I don't think this makes Marvin a hypocrite because he ran into Tomac last year and probably wasn't super pumped. Plus, he wasn't ultra mad, but... Dude, you got to stand up for yourself. You can't get knocked off the track and say, yes, I will do nothing about this. You got to at least threaten it. I think that's all Marvin was doing. He didn't guarantee that he's going to punt Webb next week. He didn't say, look out next time. He said, we'll have to see when we're in this situation again what happens. I think Marvin handled it uh, as well as he could. But I'm telling you, man, they're going to put it on the tombstone. That Tomac hit last year at Foxborough is going to follow Marvin Muskin around for the rest of his days It always gets brought up. It always, always, always gets brought up. He won the race, man. What's wrong with that? I told you I'm not offended by block passes. Did Tomek get hurt in that corner in Foxborough last year? Did he? Oh, he didn't. Like I said. Okay, let's get into our interview. First, Brett Smith, BJ Smith, the Beege. Talking about one of the wildest stories in motocross history. Yeah, it doesn't involve a racing result, but you're really going to enjoy this one men of now a certain age, which includes me and you, like I remember 1997 and I remember Carmichael and I remember the Racer X newspaper issue with this thing on the cover. So you're familiar with it. Like, you know, when you hear the Oakley Carmichael photo, I'm sure you knew exactly what it was, right? Like we all know what this photo is. We do, but I'm not sure many people do. So here's what I'm going to use BJ here to prove how big a deal this was. This photo was on a billboard. What do you think? Maybe the most visible billboard in the United States, a motocross photo. That is nuts. So I want to possibly right the there. world, possibly the, the world. world. That's crazy because look, man, we've our whole lives have been like, imagine if Moto was mainstream. Imagine if Moto was bigger. This was like one of these slices of, oh my god, it actually happened briefly. That's yeah, this, that's crazy. This yeah. billboard was on I four hundred five South, just south of the Los Angeles International Airport, where two hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty thousand cars drive i think it was a week a month it's in the article the billboard company said we're getting a we're guaranteeing our clients a million impressions wow. a month a month yep if you buy the space and oakley put a photo on it so that's what leads us into this they picked a motocross photo oh but also mention this part there was a reason they had to scramble to throw something on they already had the billboard space right but they had to scramble To throw something. They didn't originally intend to put a motocross photo on it. (laughs) Yeah, they they had a campaign for a shoe. um, And it was was just a bad taste advertisement. And so they they took it down after getting a lot of hate mail. And someone said, what about that Carmichael photo? Perfect format. They'd already printed posters. And the, the, the posters are what I think people would remember better. Because they still pop up. Every once in a while, someone will go... Hey, how do I get one of these posters? What is the story behind this poster? Yep. And that poster became a billboard, and the billboard is what the photographer saw. He didn't yeah. see the billboard in person. He saw the billboard on the cover of the Racer X that you just mentioned. Yeah, so that leads us to the actual origins of this photo. So to me, it's just huge that there, at one point, briefly, was a motocross billboard. As you mentioned in this story, Racer X, it kind of timed out nicely that there was Supercross in Los Angeles at the time, so it worked out really well for the sport. But this is not like, oh, they just 
Simon Cudby shoots photos for them, and they just took one of his photos. The crazy thing is, this photo had no business being that famous. It had no business even being used, in a way. And this photographer was completely unproven and shot from the stands. That is so nuts. What's cool about it, yeah, is it's a 4 by 6 print. This is a print that you would get at the photo map that <laughs> sat in the middle of the parking lot in a shopping mall. Um, and it wound up in Oakley's offices. And my favorite part of the story reporting it was when I realized that the photographer, David St. Ange, only had 50% of the story. Oakley only had 50% of the story. <laughs> like these two parties had never combined to figure out the other side of it. All Oakley knew was that this photograph just wound up in their office. All David knew was that he had given this photo to Ricky Carmichael when Ricky asked for it at the Charlotte Supercross. All the details of the whole thing, going back to Ricky saying, you got to tell the story behind the photograph, had been completely screwed up. It ranges from he shot it in St. Louis, uh, he gave it to Chad Watts, he was a disgruntled photographer who couldn't get a press pass. And so he, out of spite, he went into the stands and just started shooting photos with a telephoto lens. All false. All completely false. He was a fan. He never asked anyone for a press pass. He just showed up. First Supercross race he ever shot. Yes, he did have a telephoto lens. No, he did not sneak it in. He just brought it. And I know you're not supposed to bring those. But it was a. it was a... It wasn't a Simon Cudby grade lens or even camera. It was all prosumer cheap Rebel G 35 millimeter film, you know, Kodak Royal 1000. It was a cheap lens. It was a 70 by 200 or 300. I can't remember. And yeah, he's like in the 17th row, which was funny because when Davy Coombs first saw the photo, he went, how do you get that angle? Yeah. Because you ha- you would have to be high up, and all the photographers are down on the floor for the most part, and they're shooting up. So any any uh, photo taken of a rider in the air, the camera's pointed in the air, and so it, it was cool to finally get the yep. backstories from each side and then combine them to write this story. Ah, uh, so the real key here is that really until this story, which is out this week. It's really the first time that the story has ever actually really been completely figured out. No one person actually knew. The photographer didn't really know Oakley's end, and Oakley didn't know the photographer's end. Like, this magazine story is like the first time the entire story has ever been actually figured out. Exactly. The only <laughs> link that, that, that connected the photographer with Oakley was the moment when Ricky Carmichael and David St. Ange, the photographer, met briefly in an autograph line at the Charlotte Supercross in 1997, which was one week after the photograph was taken. And Ricky saw the photo and said, that's badass. Could I have it? Like yeah. David, just, <laughs> David just wanted to show him the photo. <laughs> and all the other riders that he'd taken photos of were just kind of like, eh, you know, McGrath, Button, maybe, maybe I'm making that up. But those are the riders at the time. Right. He was going around showing riders the photos yep. and writers like eh, great you know and, and in hindsight he's like yeah my photos were crappy you know i was just learning i was just learning how to be a photographer it was just a passion that he had and, but when he got to carmichael the photo legitimately is cool you've seen it mm-hmm. ricky looks at it and goes can i have this which is it's by like, the way that is but that if there's anything that dates this story of how long ago it was it's that how many photos and how much access to photos does Ricky Carmichael has he had in his life? Millions. He could have videos, photos, whatever he wants all the time. Jerseys with his name on it. Pick t-shirts with his name on it. Toys with his name on it. Whatever. That's how innocent. At that point, Carmichael was like, oh, sweet. A cool photo of me. I want that. That is hilarious. Sure. But also, <laughs> but also remember this. This is his ninth or tenth race by the time we get to Charlotte. Yep. As a professional rider, yep. he's a kid he's 17 years old he hasn't seen i of course a lot of great photos have been taken of him as an amateur yeah but he remembers this moment that's in the photograph too so at the moment that he gets this physical photograph in his hand it was one week later and so he still remembers doing this whip oh okay and he's like damn and he, and 22 years later he still remembers 
that whip. He remembers the feeling. He remembers what it looked like as he approached the face of the jump, how the ruts were in the track that night. So he still remembers all that. So imagine how fresh that was one week later to see that moment captured in a frame. So this is why he wanted it. Like Carmichael actually wanted, and the guy gave yes. it to him, right? And the guy yeah. gave it to him. And, and that's then where it goes dark. from there, yes. <laughs> yeah. so, like, so Carmichael, uh, the photo makes it back to Oak- Oakley. Yep. You, need to re- you need to read the story to get all the details. We don't want to give too much away here. Right, right. But, so Oakley has this photo, and they, they, don't know, they don't know who the photographer is. Yeah. <laughs> and then nearly a year later, the photographer sees his photo on a billboard. Uh, but let me not read, on the let's billboard. Read the be- let's read. Yeah, I'm not. Let's read the beginning of the story. Sure. Let's read the first paragraph. All right. Story. So time. the story is called "One Hit Wonder: The Untold Story Behind the Most Expensive Photograph in Motocross History." With a camera slung over his shoulder, David Saint Ange walked down an arena hallway looking for something to shoot, something worthy of a magazine cover. At least that was the goal. St. Ange had press credentials for round six of the 1997-98 PJ1 Arena Cross Series in Hampton, Virginia. He didn't get a cover that weekend, however. Not even an inset photo. Instead, on his walk, he found something even more unexpected. One of his photographs already on the cover of a magazine. Although black and white and cropped, it was unmistakably a photo he'd captured nine months earlier from the seats at the 1997 Pontiac Supercross, the very first stadium race he ever attended. Still 15 feet away from the vendor's magazine rack, he froze and stared. It was the Racer X that he was seeing. And he's having an out-of-body experience over the whole thing. Right, because there Just is Just like no... WTF in his head. You know? Yes, because there is no possible way that he could figure out in that moment how his photo was on a billboard in Los Angeles. There's yeah, no and this possible is 19, way he could have figured out how this happened. Now it's 1998. It's January 98. Right. And he can't like pull out his phone. He can't log onto the World Wide Web. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, he could. It existed, obviously, but he's, right. he's in an arena. Yeah. He didn't have a pocket computer. Yeah. So he's this whole weekend. He's just stewing over this whole thing. Yes. Like... He shot a photo. It was never published anywhere. And then all of a sudden he sees a picture of it on a billboard. Yeah, I can't imagine the emotions that run through you. You just be like, I cannot come up with any possible explanation of the, how this happened. How do they have my photo? <laughs> I mean, he did know, I guess, that he gave it to Carmichael. But that's a pretty big, it's a pretty big leap from handing it to a rider at a race. Yeah. To it ending up in a billboard, which, I mean, for motocross, that's like never happened ever, pretty much. No, I don't know. I mean, it, <laughs> it, 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 it does, but not in that context now. I mean, we'll see like billboards to advertise races, maybe down in Paula or whatnot. But in that moment, associated with that brand, Oakley, oh, yeah. you know, yep. that, was, that was huge. Yeah, and another thing you mentioned, it, Carmichael, it's his rookie season in Supercross. <laughs> As you said to me, this is way pre-GOAT. Like, it's a little easier now to look back and be like, you get a badass photo of Ricky Carmichael, maybe something's going to happen with it. But this is Ricky Carmichael. They, they were inklings. I mean, we all knew he was fast as an amateur, and it might work out as a pro. But this was long before we knew that he was the greatest of all time. He was only in the 125 class at the time. Yeah, so that makes it even like, a little more obscure. He had two wins at that point. Yes. If you had shot a badass Jeremy McGrath photo in 96, 97, 98, it's still probably not going to be a billboard. But it's maybe a little more something. But that makes it even more odd that Oakley, out of all times ever, they went in on essentially this kid at the time. I don't understand what Oakley saw that yep. we didn't. This, the original photo has never been published until now. Mm-hmm. It's in this issue of Racer X. And not only is the photo published in the pages of the article... This month's pullout poster is a nearly two foot by one foot poster, double sided. It's the original photo that only the photographer, Ricky Carmichael, 
and some people at Oakley have ever seen. It is startling, because uh, obviously I can see the proofs. It is startling to see the real image when you've seen it one way for 22 years now of your life. As I have, you have. Anyone that followed the sport back then has seen this photo a million times. If anyone says Oakley Carmichael photo, you have an instant image in your head of what it looks let's, like. Let's describe it for everyone. All right. The poster is six feet long. <laughs> I bought one. Oh, just you did to write this article. I had to have it. I had. To have oh, it. Like, you didn't buy this. it when you were eighteen years old or whatever. You couldn't buy it. That oh, was the cool right. thing. <laughs> not at least not that I could find. Yeah, they gave these posters away to dealers as gifts. Mm-hmm. Nobody could tell me exactly how many posters were made, but I challenge you to go try to find one now. You might be able to. But it won't be easy. Well, you did it. You you went through these hoops. I put an alert out on eBay. Uh huh. Ricky Carmichael poster Oakley something like that. Yeah. And a few months later, I got an alert. It popped up. It has an 18 inch tear in it, and I still bought it because <laughs> I just had to see this thing. Yeah. I won't tell you how much I paid. It wasn't astronomical, but it was way more than any sane person would pay for. A poster with a giant rip in it. It would bring you to your knees. Oh, yeah, I'm done, bro. Of course. Mouse. Mouse. <laughs> You're out. Yeah. You wouldn't even be able to open the wallet. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had to see it. And when you unroll it, and you're like, and it's going across your living room, and you're like, I'm running out of space because how long is this this thing? It's an, it's insanely huge. Wow. And you're looking at it and you're like, this thing is grainy. Like, would you look at it up close? It's like fuzzy. You can't make out any of the logos on Ricky's bike. The the only text that is discernible is the number 70 on his number plate, which makes it even more confusing that it could be on a billboard, which is several hundred square feet of space. I, yeah, I don't know enough about the printing process. Certainly in those days, most of my time been around has been digital, so you're just basing it on the, the megabytes of the image. I don't so know the, the tech- sub- I was gonna say I don't know the technology to take a four by six printout, not even a negative, and turn it into this gigantic <laughs> billboard. And in, in the article, you see that I spoke with the person who was responsible for this whole campaign. It wasn't just one photo. It wasn't just a Carmichael photo. They did hundreds of athletes across dozens of sports. With this, this was look, a, this right. yeah. This was a campaign where uh, yeah, exactly. They had this look, yeah. and they were using. I mean, it wasn't we we simpletons call it black and white. You know, artists are, are talking about like all these different tones of grays yeah. and blacks and whites and shades, and um, so that process is very involved if if you're in that field. And that's what they applied to this photo. You look at the original, you look what Oakley did, and it's like, wow, how did you even get there? So they make it grayscale. They blur the background. It's it's, so the photo is Carmichael laid over completely flat. And in 1997, that was still like, whoa. I mean, how did, A, how did he do that on that yeah. bike? Like, how was that even possible to whip right. like and that? And he does mention in the story, by the way, right, that the tracks were so much more rutted back then that not only the bikes, the jumps were smaller, the bikes weren't as fast, but the, especially Pontiac, I mean, you grew up going to that race. Track was exactly. gnarly, dude. Way gnarly. Oh, yeah. Looked like a motocross track by the end of the night. It was so, right. so rough. Yeah. And so that's it. The only thing in the photo. And, and you just assume that the background is the crowd, even though you can't make out any people. Yep. It's the, just, it's, I think Dave, Davey likes to call it this Orwellian, <laughs> like, look, this, it, it, this, this dark, foreboding, gunfighter, um, Soviet-era looking uh, scene. And then you look at the original, which you can only see by you know logging into the the digital racer X or getting a copy in your mailbox or at the newsstands yep. it's you see everything you can see the crowd you can't make out faces, but you can tell they're individual people. you can see what the people are doing. you can see the flagmen, you can see the hay bale covers, yes, they were hay under yeah. those covers, yeah, you see the jumps, you see a flash bulb. Up in the upper left-hand corner, which was my absolute favorite detail of the original photo, is that someone else, some other fan, has this moment from the other side of the stadium. You see a Suzuki coming into the frame, which who knows who it is, because there were 11 Suzukis in that heat race that night. 
and you see one photographer down on the ground. And like I said a few minutes ago, he's pointing up. He's craning his neck to get to get that shot. And you see two men like, standing in the infield, one of them whom we believe is Ali Seymour, Kevin Windham's mechanic. It does look is, like him. It does. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I reached out to Ali and I said, is this you? And he goes, I, I don't know. I said, well, were you there that night? He goes, yeah. Because Kevin was racing – the 250 class. Yeah, maybe. He was moonlighting as a 250 rider that night because mm. he was still in the 125 class. Mm-hmm. And Carmichael is not nearly as close as he is in that original, in the Oakley poster that we all know so well. Yeah, uh, it's interesting that you bring that up. Yeah, because you'll see the photo. What I was getting at is when you've seen this photo for 21 or 22 years, like many of us have, it is striking to see the original and be like, wait, it. That's it, but it's not it. it it's so weird uh, how much different it is, which leads me to the next point. The real hook in this story is, did Oakley have the rights to use this, and did they owe the photographer or what? Now, what's interesting is, for sure, it's his photo. The photo is awesome, is unique to have that angle and everything. But the look, a lot of that is Oakley. They applied, as you said, the look that they had done for a lot of athlete ads to the photo. So... The original photo is good, but it's not what you're expecting when you see that uh, Oakley ad that we've seen for so long. So that's what makes it so interesting. Oakley applied their own touch to it, but it doesn't matter. You can't just take somebody's photo, and that becomes the big hook here. So what do you do if you're in the marketing department right, at Oakley, and this photo comes across your desk, and everyone I spoke to, nobody could remember like who okayed this like who was the i went on a a several days search trying to figure out who green lighted this thing like it was that good this four by six print that was probably covered in fingerprints (laughs) by then Mm -hmm. because it got muled back to irvine california yep who said f it let's run with this let's do it like they wanted to make it that bad. It is they, like we, they can't right. find the photographer. Ricky didn't know. Johnny O'Mara didn't know. I went all the way to Jim Gennard. Yeah, the founder of the Oakley. founder of Oakley, who talks yes. to nobody. Oh, really? Known for this? Oh, he's he's very elusive. He's oh, he's wow. very uh, he's very um, catcher in the rye. I'm I'm, I'm blanking on the, the author. J D. Salinger, very reclusive. Mm. He doesn't he doesn't do any. That's a different story though. <laughs> He just writes back and he's like, I love the photo. That's it. I love the photo. I don't, he didn't, he, they didn't know who the photographer was. And he didn't tell me this, but all the marketing people were like, we can see Jim just saying, let's just ask for forgiveness. Uh, it says a lot about the photo though, because obviously at that point, you're taking a pretty big risk of like, we could get in trouble. We might have to give forgiveness or pay somebody or we could get in trouble for this, but we want the photo so badly, we are willing to take that risk and by the way you can get photo they can get photos of their athletes racing supercross races all day long but they couldn't get a photo like this isn't that crazy they can get photos they couldn't get this photo yeah one photographer told me he'd been submitting fo- photos to oakley for months trying to mm-hmm. trying to get in with their mm-hmm. marketing department trying to get one of those one of those advertisements because that's you know all the photographers today are still doing the same thing they're trying to provide us with great content but we don't pay them any money right to for them to make any money they've they've got to go sell photos to ktm to honda to to racer x to whoever will, will pay them yeah yeah and there's always going to be more money in it on the advertising side than the editorial side like we do have photographers we pay at racer x but i i would assume that they're breaking more money from the gear brands and goggle brands in this case et cetera, et cetera than they're making from us. Right. So all these photographers who are true professionals, press passes, real cameras, experience, know where to go, know who to shoot, know what to look for, trying, 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 striking out, striking out. And this dude in the stands with a prosumer camera gets a photo that's so good that Jim Gennard, who we have to assume has one of the greatest business minds in the history of business, right? He's built two massively successful companies. Second billionaire in Orange County, California. Okay, there you go. This one photo is like, I don't care use it. It's that good. And by the way, it is. Like when you see that Oakley ad, it makes all the sense in the world, I think. It's just awesome. That's why we call the story One Hit Wonder. Yep. 
I mean, all these guys down on the floor with f- at least five figures in equipment. Yeah. They've been at it for years. Mm-hmm. And then this guy who had never been to a Supercross race in his life takes this photo. I will say this, though. When you see the original, you see the ragged hay bale covers and how much air Ricky's really getting. When you see the Oakley ad, it looks like he's 100 feet in the air racing in front of 1 million fans, doesn't it? It does. It does. And uh, Tom Moyer called it atmospheric perspective. Mm. That's what they did. That's what they call this this look. Mm -hmm. And, And so what we're seeing is probably less than half of the actual photo it is it is that cropped Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean if you're looking at the print we are seeing the top three inches yes yes all the in the real photo there's so much track that you see and that's all gone yep makes it look like it's 100 feet in the air (laughs) yeah it was it was just such a fun story to report on because it's 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 a story that you know no one, nobody need, we don't need to know it, but it was so delicious and fun, you know, because as Chris, this didn't make the article, but I spoke with Chris Holtner, who was the one who took the photo of the billboard. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, whenever we think of Carmichael, this is the photo that we associate him with. This will ever forever be known as the Carmichael photo. Yep. I'm with you. Yep. And... It's amazing because, again, this is how many photos, how many Carmichael things and stories and TV shows and everything have been done. But this one, that's nuts. That's the one-hit wonder, right? (laughs) That early in his career, too. Yeah. Yeah, he was not iconic. I know, again, I'm not saying Carmichael was not a big deal. Actually, you probably raced Carmichael when you were growing up a little bit, didn't you? I I had raced him probably within 12 months of this photo being taken. Right. So it's not, okay, we knew that he was good. We knew he was a fast amateur. We're not claiming that Carmichael came out of nowhere. But, I mean, this is, hey, Supercross fans right now, this is uh, Justin Cooper or somebody like that. This is like a pretty good guy in his rookie year in the 250 class right now. It's not the Ricky Carmichael that we know now. I, I can't stress that. Enough. Yes, we knew he was going to be good. Yes, he was a hot amateur, but it is far from becoming the goat at this time. Yeah, but yeah. it's it. And on the same note, it's so Carmichael. It is to, to yep. do this. Yep. This wasn't a main event win either. That was another urban legend. Everyone's like, oh yeah, the photo of Carmichael winning the St. Louis Supercross. Well, a it's Pontiac. B it's a heat race. <laughs> and it, one of the things that Johnny O told me, it didn't make the article in the quotes. But he's like, that's. <laughs> a heat race like, what are you doing bro like, you could you could kill yourself here <laughs> yeah, heat, yeah. Heat race win. Like, come on let's get through the night at least you yeah know? he doesn't even win um, the main that night he only no gets third. he does not win the main yeah that was another another myth yeah. that it was a victory lap no because oh, remember okay. back then there was no live tv so riders would cross the finish line they didn't have to go straight to the podium to get their interview from uh, jenny taft or daniel blair or whomever it was um might have been davy coombs um yeah they would do a victory lap Riders would, would go out and just like start showboating and have a lap for the fans. Um, no, not true. This was the heat race win, and that was the that was the, the the move that he did. And the doubles were not that big, which is another like how did you how this is why I can't stress it. You need to go pick up this issue and, and see this photo, get this poster. It's incredible. Yeah, it is shocking a to see the original in the story and then to actually have that poster, uh, which is something new that we're putting posters in the magazine now. This is a pretty worthy. Worthy one. I want to ask two things about the process of you tracking this story. By the way, you tracked down the guy that shot this photo? Because by the way, folks, he doesn't turn out to be the greatest photo uh, photographer in the history of motocross. Like, he's obscure then, he's obscure now. How did you even find this guy? It's not like he works in the industry or anything today. It, it really wasn't that hard. I wish I, wow. had, I, wish I could make up a better story. Oh, okay. But I, I found his email address... You can find people on Facebook these days. It's pretty huh. easy. Um, so I had that in my pocket. But then I found his email address on the Vital MX message board or forum. And he, <laughs> within the last 13 months, he got embroiled in a little bit of a keyboard battle, bringing in Chris Holtner again. Remember, he was the one who took the photo of the billboard 
from the highway that appeared on the cover of Racer X. That's a key part of the story. People have accused him, David St. Ange, the guy who took the actual photo. Mm -hmm. You didn't take this photo, bro. This isn't your photo. Chris Holtner took this photo. Oh, no. David St. Ange doesn't know Chris Holtner. This is not part of the story, which is why I'll, I'll elaborate. He's still battling the myth of this photograph. People still accuse him of, of not being the actual photographer. So he's, he has a bunch of posters still. He got a bunch of posters, and he sold one to a guy. And the guy reaches out to him and accuses him of not being the actual photographer. Wow. And, 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 and so he's on, he's, uh, on the, the, the message board with the keyboard warriors and trying to like defend himself a little bit. And someone points out to him, like, no, it's actually Chris Holtner took the photo of the photo. And anyways, he had put his email address there. And I emailed him and I didn't think he was going to want to tell the story. I thought there was going to be a lot of hesitation. I thought I was going to have to, you know, work on him for a while. And we exchanged phone numbers. I said, Hey, let's just do a phone call and just, just warm up to each other and get to know each other a little bit. And we set a date. I called him and we started talking and I'm like, you cool. You just want to, you just want to do this now? He's like, yeah, let's just do it now. Talk for three hours. Whoa. And, and he, he, was, just, he was, he's not bitter about any of this. No, he just, yeah. un, he unloaded the whole story on me. Yeah. Cause uh, again, you got to read the story to know the deal. I mean, he did eventually have to try to get some money out of Oakley when this happened, but it, but it did, he, he's not a, uh, yeah, he's not super angry about this shouldn't happen or anything like that. And so it is now, we are in early April. Mm -hmm. MetLife is coming up. This guy is from New York state. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a hike, but he is coming over to MetLife. Okay. He wants to meet, well, he's already met Ricky Carmichael, remember, because he gave him the photo. Oh, yeah. He wants Charlotte to, 97 he wants, for 38 he, seconds, probably. <laughs> he wants to reunite with Ricky. Ricky's down with it. He's mm -hmm. bringing one of the original posters. Cool. Ricky's going to sign it. We're going to do a photo op. That poster is going to be given to the Road to Recovery Foundation. Oh, nice. And, we're going, and they're going to uh, either auction it off or do a raffle of, of, of some kind. I don't exactly have those details yet, but look for that. We'll be promoting it um, on Racer X's social channels. I think this is a very cool opportunity to get one of these posters that's original. <laughs> hard to get, almost impossible this is to get. Very hard to get. Yeah. Yep. Autographed by Ricky Carmichael. Oh, so we're doing that this year here in uh, whatever it is, three weeks or whatever this yes, is when yes. the race is coming. Oh, awesome. Yep. And that's yeah, the only so time St. Ange, David St. Ange, a photographer, and Carmichael have ever met was just that one time at Charlotte when he handed him the picture. Just that one time. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, we're on the, I'm on the phone with, with St. Ange, and again, he's totally sharing all the details of the story. He was happy to talk. I don't think anyone had ever bothered to try to get his side of the story. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that I think that happens a lot. People are like, uh, maybe afraid to, to call someone or they don't know where to start. And so you just don't start at all. Right. Sure. I, I don't, I tend not to have those. Um, uh, yeah, you don't. <laughs> you yeah. I'll, don't. I'll, just, I'll yeah. jump right in there. I don't care. Oh yeah. Yep. And, and, um, excuse me. Yeah. He's, he's, he's ready to go. He wants to meet and, and here we are. Um, did he know all the details of the story or when you talk to him, was he still in that? I only have forty to fifty percent of the info. Right. Were there things you were telling him that he didn't? He has no idea. Yeah. Right. Well, I talked to him first. He was first. Okay. And then there was a lot of back and forth. You know, just quick picking up quick pieces of information. Yeah. I mean, he's as curious as anyone okay. in this whole ordeal. He's like, <laughs> he doesn't know what what happened. Um. So yeah, I've, I've told him like what what Carmichael told me, what Johnny O told me. Um. What was really interesting was that his memory is very clear mm -hmm. because this was a big, uh, um, imagine something big that happened in, in your life. You remember the details of it. Like Absolutely. when a child is born or when you had a traumatic injury or something really, really wonderful that happened in your life. Well, they call you, it, this you, is a brush with greatness, right? The one time you met a celebrity or got to be on a TV game show or something big. Exactly. The one time you, you were famous, you'll never you forget remember those. Details. You remember yes. those details. Yes. So this was a big, big deal for him. But the people at Oakley, and this is why I talk to so many people. They remembered it, 
Lewis Wellen remembered the photo, like pinned to the cubicles all around Oakley. He remembers seeing it all over the place. Nobody remembers the tiny details, though. Again, who made the decision to run with this thing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who handed it? To, like, what was the chain of, like, again, this is an actual photograph. It wasn't a digital, it wasn't an email to everybody. Right. Like, how did this, nobody remembers. Because they did this every day of every week. Dealt with photos, made decisions. Jim Gennard made thousands of decisions a month. Right. So he doesn't... He just he remembers the big picture. He doesn't remember the little details. This was just another transaction at Oakley. I didn't feel like anyone was withholding information, except for the lawyer, of course, because that's attorney-client privilege. She just she couldn't. Right. It wouldn't be legal to do that. Um, so on Oakley's side, it was just like, yeah, we remember it, but we can't remember the fine details. If Davey doesn't tell Chris Holtner to shoot a picture of the billboard, and that doesn't run on the cover of the Racer X newspaper that David St. Ange, the photographer, happens to see. Does David St. Ange ever know that this even happened? I was hot on that trail, too, uh -huh. and Davey kind of brought me back down to earth because he's like, dude, he's going to realize it eventually, right? I mean, the <laughs> internet did exist. Photos okay. were shared. Because I thought the same thing. I thought, my God. He hadn't gone for that walk at the arena cross and seen that newsstand. Yes. But he was going to Supercross races. Would he have opened up the cover of the 1998 Supercross program and not seen that photograph, which is, go back and look at your opening spread. First that's two pages of the article. Right? Yeah. That's what, that, that's what that magazine is open to. But, Jason, I like to think maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe it's, not. it's possible. Maybe I, he makes yeah. it through the entire five months of the Supercross season and just misses it. Hey, by the way, in the story, you mentioned that uh, Oakley replaced it uh, with it <laughs> when the billboard came down, the, the motocross photo, when they moved on to the next thing, it was of another iconic athlete. You know what else I think makes those posters so cool and valuable and interesting from back then? Hmm. The most iconic photo like that and poster like that ever I, you probably remember this. Nike had done this iconic Michael Jordan poster where he just had his arms spread out. And it was, again, like a six foot wide, black and white, extremely horizontal and not very vertical uh, of him palming a basketball. And it's I do and remember white. that. Yeah, yes. yeah. That is a super iconic, kind of like this Carmichael thing, out of the gazillions of Michael Jordan images and posters and shirts and photos and videos and all that. It's one of the most iconic things ever. So I even feel like this poster this is probably eight or nine years after that Jordan poster. It had a little bit of that residue still on it of like, that's what iconic looks like. Uh, which to me at the time probably even added to how valuable this poster would be, except you can't, you couldn't get one. <laughs> you couldn't buy it. No, only, <laughs> only dealers got them to, to yes. my knowledge and any, and like the one that I bought, it came from a dealer. Still it now, like from, a dealer it had it. It came from a guy who who had run a dealership. I think he he wasn't in business anymore, and he just he'd hung on to some posters. He gave a couple of he had three of them somehow, yeah. And he gave two away, and this one he sold. Well, that's going to be awesome. You'll see it in the issue that comes out uh, literally tomorrow, uh, April third. You can see our new digital edition, and then it'll be in your mailbox if you're a subscriber. And then keep a lookout once we get it signed by RC at uh, MetLife here in a few weeks, right after Easter. By the way, last thing I want to talk to you about is you mentioned that you don't seem to have a problem calling people on the phone. What is your weirdo deal when it comes to these stories? Because your stories, like, it's so funny when you and I talk. You have no interest in, like, hey, how did Marvin Muskan win the race over the weekend? Or how did Cooper Webb win the race over the weekend? I don't want to say no interest. You're a fan of the sport. But those are not the stories that draw you. You're always drawn to this stuff. Well, I mean, I think people tend to forget that these are human beings riding dirt bikes. Mm-hmm who are very, very good at what they do. I'm more interested in the people than I am, like, what's happening on the track. You know, I was as interested as all of you were uh, about watching Marvin and Cooper slam into each other at the Houston Supercross last week, and I, mean, I found that fascinating. Yeah, as but, a fan, right. You're yeah, as a, yes. as a fan. Yeah. But when, when I dive into a story, like, I'm more interested in just, just hearing people talk about their lives and what drives them, you know? Um, like Eli Tomac, for instance, 
I'm interested in his story just because I want to I want to understand what makes him tick, which is a hot button topic right now that I think everyone can relate to. Wow. So a a a um a, something that's happening right now, a present day issue that I would be interested in is going to spend some time with Eli Tomac and figuring out what what goes on inside his mind. Mm-hmm. I stop short of saying, what's wrong with you? I think all the, the you know, the people, all the fans are that you want to say, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? That's not, <laughs> right. that's not what I'm interested in. Like I would, I would generally, I wouldn't come at him with that question and expect a good answer. Cause that's not, that's not how you approach something like this. Uh, to tell that story, I would go spend real time with him, not at the racetrack. You know, if he's willing to allow me to in, into his life like that, I mean, that's a very that that's difficult to do. But I I don't know. Yeah, I've been able to, I've been able to get that access. Uh, the Austin Forkner story is an example of something I wrote for my brand. We went fast dot com. I went and spent time with his family. That's how I got that story. I well, spent time with his mother and father and asked, you know, lots and lots of questions. And I, I don't know, I guess I just make those around me feel comfortable. Like, why would she tell me about, you know, her battle with endometriosis? I mean, that's a pretty intimate yeah. subject. Yeah. To share with the media. Right. Yeah. But I don't come at it with like that. Maybe you guys all have the media label on on you when 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 you come up to these guys. I I don't because I'm not covering them week to week, so I get to come from kind of a different angle. I think the angle comes from when you're getting them on race day. Everyone is pretty much in. Uh, we're talking about today's race mode, right? But when you go to them, not on the race day, you know, you go to their house as as you're doing. It makes a tremendous difference but the effort you have to put in to do that is extreme and it brings me back to the effort you put in onto this oakley story and i said i was bummed for you because like i read it you know but it doesn't take five hours to read a magazine feature you know it's not a novel so i'm like man you talked to all these people did all this effort tracked all these people down or in the case of the forkner story you went to the house you traveled you did all this and it's like they can read the forkner story on your website fairly quickly and they can read a story to magazine fairly quickly it's a yeah. lot of work for something that really doesn't last the memory does but the the it's not a epic uh four-hour documentary here yeah but it's still fun you know yeah i, I guess it's, it's yes i think that's what discourages don't. people from wanting to put in the level of effort that you're willing to do so i'm glad you do it but i think that's why you're one of the few that does yep. you know what's cool though this story that we're talking about the carmichael photo yeah you could republish this a year from now. Same story. Yep. Absolutely. The story still holds, you know? Yes. So say it ever makes it, you know, digital where it, it lives on forever and ever and ever. That's why all the stories that I write for my brand, I want them to be able to live forever and ever and ever. Like I wrote a story about Chad Reed a year ago. Yep. You can go read that story now and it still holds weight. Yep. Yep. It's his, him and his wife and the moves of coming over the United States. That's never yeah. going to be outdated. Right. You, you read yeah. that Austin Forkner story 10 years from now when say he's a, a 450 supercross champion mm-hmm. story. Still good. Yep. It's not dated. And that's, that's this story that we're talking about right now. It's in this next issue of racer X. The story will still be the same five years from now. It'll still be worth reading 10 years from now. Uh, you piqued my interest so much as we talked about this. I actually went over to eBay first. I found someone selling that Michael Jordan style poster, which it claims it's actually from 1998. So how about that? It's actually from the same exact time. So wow. That was a, clearly the, if and that was a Nike thing, but Nike and Oakley obviously know what they're doing. That was clearly the look you wanted at that time. Somebody's exactly. listing it on eBay for $299. So then I typed in Ricky Carmichael Oakley poster to see if one of the ones that you managed to get was even around. No, none are listed, but hilariously, I find this other Oakley dealer photo of Carmichael doing a whip with a blurred background. It's like Oakley tried to do it again. It's not the same. It's no. Carmichael doing a whip. The background is grayed out. It's probably fans. It's a similar idea, but it is not nearly the same. They could not, it cannot be replicated. They could not replicate it. No, I mean, yep. it's it's truly a magical moment in time. You know, I'm like bent over at my kitchen counter looking at the, the photo again. <laughs> and it's just, how can, it's that moment. Like, that is the exact midpoint 
You know, yeah. there was no burst of photographs. Yep. This was it. This yep. is one frame, one one thirtieth of a second. Yep. Yeah. It's uh, like the fan being pulled down at halftime and saying, if you make this full court shot, you you make a million dollars and your life changes. You know, and every face in the photograph, everyone is looking up the flaggers that aren't even supposed to be looking that way. Yep. Are looking that yeah. way. Yeah. You like, again, you can't make out the, the faces, but they're all looking at Carmichael and what's yeah, one guy's awesome. pointing. Yes, one there he is. pointing. Yes. Yep, there he is. Yeah, he's yeah. pointing. Um, nobody's holding up a cell phone. No. Nope. And phones and, didn't have cameras then. No, and I think, look, that's the crux of it all, right? Because that's why for Carmichael, getting this image in his hands and bringing it home was important to him. And if he had not done that, it wouldn't have ended up on Oakley's desk, and none of this would have happened. You know, there's no writer ever today that would ever be so struck by an image that they'd need to have a copy of it. It's just not rare enough. But that's where we were in 1997. Yeah. And I know you've all listened to us for the last 40 minutes talk about this story, but you don't have the whole story. You have to go read the rest of the story. It's a, it's a very fun read. And, and me and Wygant and Davey, Racer X, we want to keep doing more of these stories. I want to bring people back to reading that might be a you know in this in this digital age of endless scrolling and and thinking that photographs are the only things that we need to look at anymore we want to keep doing this because this is a lot of fun bro we got the solution we got the new digital digital edition it's no different than scrolling through instagram it scrolls vertically so you've got no excuse folks and uh yeah we left a lot out the the huge part we've left out is the entire process of St. Ange trying to track down Oakley and them trying to figure out if this dude should be paid and how much and all that. Uh, it gets, it gets that it gets very interesting. I'll just say at the midpoint when he discovers this, uh, but you'll have to read the story to find about all those details. Yep. A little juicy piece of motocross history finally solved. Awesome. Yeah. Even for him, that's hilarious. Even the photographer himself had no idea what the heck happened until now. <laughs> 22 oh, years later. Fu- another funny note. Uh, he, he asked me, uh, do you think Carmichael's mad at me? Ah! <laughs> why, why, why would he be mad at you? I don't think he, re, he might not even remember. Like he remembers being handed a photograph, of course, but no, he's not mad at you. And we're going to reconnect them at MetLife. This should be really fun. And I can't wait to, to get some photos of those two together. I think that's going to be a, 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 fun, a fun experience. All right, that's Brett Smith. Check out One Hit Wonder, which you can now read at digital.racerxonline.com. Or if you're a subscriber, you can see it at digital.racerxonline.com. Or just wait, and you'll have the magazine in your mailbox soon. And the one thing we cannot do in a podcast is show you the photo. So you will see what the Oakley ad looked like. And then for the first time ever, you will see the original full-color version of the photo, which has never been printed before until this magazine right now. Quick break. We're going to talk about Yoshimura again. Of course, that's our sponsor. They were the ones that wanted me to do a podcast really badly. Well, I wanted to do one, but they were the ones that gave me the boot in the behind and made this happen. Yoshimura, six decades of four-stroke performance for your biker quad. 2019 systems are shipping for all new models, including the KTM and Husqvarna brands. If you're serious, it's Yoshimura. Check out their new website, Yoshimira-RD.com. Now, let's talk to Davey Coombs about Brock Tickle and the latest with drug testing in the sport. Okay, we'll start here. We talked to BJ Smith about his story uh, with uh, David St. Ange and his unbelievable one-in-a-billion photo that ends up on a billboard. And uh, Davey, we have you here, too. Although, I almost feel like I've got to ask you about that Carmichael story, too, because I think you were just as interested in the subject as BJ was. He was already headed that direction. And then you said, hey, head in this direction. He wanted to do it. You wanted to do it. (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I kind of had a front row seat to it and, and a little bit of involvement in that, um, you know, it was Racer X, the newspaper, kind of triggered the whole uh, uh, legal case because that's how David St. Ange figured out that Oakley was <laughs> using the photo. Right. And, uh, and then it became uh, sort of I became the conduit between uh, the photographer and, and Oakley. And, uh, you know, that was just that was just a different time back then. But 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 what it 
what it really was was a, it was a, it was a one in a million shot that someone saw and someone loved and uh, had to have it. And uh, lo and behold, it becomes the most valuable motocross photo ever shot. The part that makes me laugh the most to give you an idea of how innocent everything was back then. This I said this to BJ. This is Ricky Carmichael, who has had so many photos and videos of him taken and so many interviews and he's been on t-shirts and toys and hats and all this stuff but he was so innocent then that he's like hey cool photo man can i have it like he <laughs> yeah. wanted the photo of himself <laughs> yeah and, and then the only person he knew with a color copier was uh johnny o'mara at oakley and he's like can you make more copies of this oh my and, gosh and just think about how different things are now with desktop publishing and everyone's got a color printer at home and you know the way photography is it uh, it, it certainly harkens back to a, a more innocent time when the world was a much bigger place uh, now your story here could not be more opposite this is certainly a story of our times and it is definitely not a simple place uh, we've tackled this Brock tickle thing several times uh, I did a story on him in the magazine probably a little less than a year ago you and I and Roy Jansen sat down with a podcast about how this drug tasting came to be I've done a podcast with tickle his sentence hasn't been announced yet, but it does seem like we, we have to visit this story again because it does seem like things are starting to change. There's been some updates, if yeah, not a the wheels, but things are happening. Yes. Finally, finally, the wheels of justice, uh, so to speak, are turning. And, and a lot of credit for that, and I know people don't understand this, a lot of the credit for that goes to the AMA, and particularly Rob Dingman and Kevin Crowther. After the FIM had a, an election last fall, or actually early December, uh, the old administration was removed uh, along with some of the higher ups in the FIM, and uh, that that was uh, to me a positive move because I, I believe that there's long been a baked in AMA U.S. rider U.S. series bias from the FIM. They they were really been able to crack. Uh, the United States, as far as you know, MXGP, uh, their 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 uh, connections to World Supercross, quote unquote, are you know not really as as deep as what the AMA's is, and nor should it be. Um, and and but this changeover, uh, rather than having cases like Brock Tickles and Cade Clausens and James Stewart's go die on some lawyer's desk in Geneva. They're actually getting action on these cases, and that's a lot to do with Rob Dingman being on the, the executive board now, uh, and, and also the new president, uh, Vegas, uh, being a, you know, sort of a, a, an athlete's um, president, if you will, and really looking out for uh, you know, the riders and, and trying to, you know, rather than hanging them out to dry forever, which is you know, what's been happening, they're actually taking action on these cases. So Brock... You know, finally, after a start again, stop again uh, case where a hearing was supposed to happen the morning of one of these supercrosses, but the, the guys didn't show up, um, he finally had his uh, a hearing in front of a, a three person uh, panel of judges to listen to his, his case and at least, you know, come up with some kind of penalty. Um, that's the good news that, that it's happening. The bad news is, and, and this is the, the worrisome part, um, in the FIM's eyes, and also in WADA and USADA's eyes, a, uh, a, a positive drug test means guilty. There's no way around it. it, it the, the evidence is empirical. There it is. How did it get there? And, and in America, we've always had this sort of innocent until proven guilty concept of, of law and order. But in a, in a case like that that involves sports and illegal substances and PEDs and whatnot, you're guilty because it's in your system. And then it's up to you as an athlete to explain the circumstances of how exactly it got there. And they start out with sort of a maximum penalty and then they whittle it down as, as they get information as you cooperate, as you explain your actions, because sometimes it really could be, hey, I had no idea. It, it was under a different name in this supplement I was taking. Or, you know, someone handed me a, a drink. I don't know who they were. And, you know, there, there, there's all kinds of different ways to approach it. But the point is, the more information you give, the more of an explanation that you give 
the more likely you are to get some leniency. And as far as, you know, I can tell, and as far as Brock has told me, uh, it's a complete mystery to him. He has no idea how it got there. And, and you know, whereas, you know, that, that alone should be enough if you're a, a Brock Tickle fan or a Brock Tickle friend, it's not enough for WADA or the FIM. And, and that's what they're struggling with right now is to, to give him his penalty. Uh, on the flip side, it's taken so long, you know, more than a year, he's missed all of Supercross this year, all of motocross last year. That's effectively two years, even though it's only one calendar year. I, I'm hopeful, and I think Brock is also hopeful, that when they do finally decide, it might just be time served. And by that, I mean, we could see him on a motocross track this summer. Uh, he's already, you know, reported on his Instagram that, that he's getting back in race shape and feeling optimistic and positive. And I think that that's a, a wonderful development. But more bad news may be yet to come. Uh, you are just guessing on that? Or you think you, you know something that's pretty heavy? Well, you just and, 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 well in, talking, in talking to uh, Mr. Dingman and talking to uh, Kevin Crowther and knowing how these things work, I mean, remember, James Stewart was taking Adderall. That was 16 months. Uh, yeah. You know, Kate Clausen also was taking Adderall and, and, and still hasn't, you know, had his day in court. Although I do understand that he has since been given a, 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 a TUE, uh, which will help as far as, you know, the, the leniency when he is finally given his day in court. Uh, because, you know, he, he, he does need this. He was just racing before he got the TUE, and that was the problem. Right. Um, but as far as Brock goes, uh, again, you know, there's no real explanation yet as to how this occurred. And, and I don't know isn't really an answer. And neither is no contest as far as the, the FIM goes or, or WADA and USADA go. Uh, you know, the idea is to, to, to you know, give someone uh, a chance to explain you know, not necessarily their innocence, but their, their, their lack of understanding or their, their motivation or, you know, whatever. But you can't just say, I don't know, uh, because, you know, these, these things don't just appear in everyday, uh, you know, supplements or, or, or um, foods or whatever. And, and that's, that's the real problem. And, and I, I feel bad for Brock because I, I truly personally believe him that he just doesn't know. And it's really hard when they, they come and tell you you failed a test to retrace what you put in your system three months ago or however long ago it was in between the drug test and the, the uh, notification that he'd failed. Uh, I, I think it was a couple months. And so, you know, imagine going back and thinking, well, when I was at the San Diego Supercross, where did I eat? What did I drink? Who was I with? Uh, how did this happen? And, and that, you know, that's that's kind of where Brock is 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 trying to figure out an explanation for uh, an illegal substance. Yeah, I remember him telling me he and his wife they even went through their phones from that week to see like are there any pictures or like restaurants we were at or who we were hanging out with to try to just unpack it all. But what's interesting here is again we've tackled the the Brock story quite a bit, both you and I and other people in the industry. What's what it sounds like is going to happen here is Brock's going to have to deal with what he's dealing with. But this might finally have be what spurred whoever gets popped next to have a different set of circumstances. He might be the one we reference as, well, until Tickle, then they change things. Because in, yeah. in the story that you wrote, it sure seems like Rob Dingman of the AMA is hellbent on, we got to make some changes here. This is not fair. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it is a different landscape now, as I said. But I, I think furthermore, not only will it help the next guy and maybe speeding this whole process up, uh, you know, maybe we can we can streamline it as well in a way that that we're all kind of on the same uh, page whenever yeah. we're doing you know this 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 type of testing. And by that I mean whether you're Supercross, MXGP, uh, Lucas Oil Pro Motocross, because um, it, it's a very complicated and complex thing. And I, I promise you, the Brock Tickle probably got more of an education and 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 diet. And in and 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 PEDs and 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 how Wada and Usana work than he 
has in his entire lifetime up until now. And I think that people see, you know, a factory rider at the peak of his career, you know, banished the sidelines for, you know, a full year and he's lost his job and, 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 you know, had a, it's been very expensive, uh, both financially and emotionally on Brock and his family. Uh, I, I think that, that people see that and, and will, you know, hopefully again, take great pains to make sure that they know exactly what they're putting in their system at all times. Uh, cause you know, they can and will catch you. Uh, you know, the, the drug testing is, is very, very scientific. There, there is, you know, if, if there's ways around it, obviously, you know, three supercross guys didn't figure it out yet. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, but, but I think that, you know, anytime you see someone who's had an ed- education, sorry, I'm driving back from the Loretta Lynn tribute concert. Yeah, and, uh, I, heard I don't think that, that my yeah. mom and sister realized that on a podcast. Oh. Yeah, it was really cool. Huh. Very cool. Yep. Anyway, um, we, uh, you know, I, I hope that the process uh, in Brock as an example will 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 help people understand that this is this is serious business and it can cost you a great deal uh not only in time but in money and certainly in reputation and um hopefully you know moving forward that doesn't happen uh to any more guys that 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 people are getting the message that that this is this is a very serious business all right two things i want to hit on brock situation you can certainly read about that in the mag but uh rob dingman being this outspoken the ama president putting stuff in the ama magazine being really not pulling any punches and being very outspoken about what he thinks the FIM has done. To me, in this industry, that is rare. Uh, people keep that stuff behind closed doors. Uh, in your experience, was that kind of shocking to you? It was to me to see him being that. Uh, I'm telling you, I'm not happy about this, and I'm not afraid to say it. I was surprised. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, someone told me to, hey, make sure you know you read Rob's column in the new American Motorcycles magazine. It's about the FIM. And I did, and I was like, huh. What I didn't realize is that he wrote about them two months in a row and the second month was oh. after the election mm-hmm. and he took the gloves off and right. laid it on Vito Ippolito and, and um, the, the old attorney was there and explained that, that, that Vegas had come in and, and you know, cleared the decks and uh, said that, 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 that it was an embarrassment and sort of a black eye, not only on Supercross, but on professional motocross and, and, and the AMA and the FIM in general. Because Rob's frustration is every time he sees mention of the the, the tickle uh, situation or, or Cade's situation, it's followed by you know stupid AMA or dumbass AMA or whatever. And this yeah. is not an AMA thing. Right. This this is a, this was an FIM thing. The AMA was pushing and and well behind the scenes for this whole year because they they have a level of frustration already with what happened to Cade and what happened to James Stewart. And they, they're, he was just tired of it. And, and, you know, no one says, oh, it's the FIM, you know, or, or understands that, you know, what, what's going on here. Nor is it WADA. Uh, this is a case of uh, a, a la- lack of um, motion, a, a, a really difficult and clumsy bureaucracy in the FIM that, that is now, you know, fortunately changed. And, uh, you know, but that doesn't change the results of a failed drug test. What it does is it speeds up the, the sentencing. And, and I think that's, I guess, to, to summarize it, that's what this story is about. The changes in the FIM and the expectations of what could happen next for Brock. And literally, it could happen any day now. Yeah, and that's really the crux of it because Brock has not denied that he failed the test, even though he doesn't know how it happened. I don't think anyone is saying, like, this is unfair, he failed the drug test. He did fail. He did fail. That that part is fair. The unfair part is, as you mentioned, just today on the news, I heard a report in downtown Charlotte. While an ambulance was attending to someone at their house, someone jumped in the ambulance and stole it and then crashed it, right? But the whole time they're telling this story, the person who stole the ambulance is considered uh, the accused. The accused, the accused. He is not, they will not say that he's actually the one that did it, even though the police and ambulance people literally saw him driving his ambulance. The, the court and how laws work and how you're guilty until proven innocent and vice versa, that's the whole problem. Everyone knows that Brock failed the test. It's the how is he treated after he failed, after he did the crime, that I think is what's getting people mad. No one's mad about the drug testing uh, itself. No, it, 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 exactly. And, 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 you know, 
as I learned in, in reporting this story, no contest is not an option in a, in a failed drug test. You can't just say, well, I, I'm not going to say I'm guilty. I'm not going to say I'm innocent. I'm just going to you know, cut my losses here and say, yeah. sentence me. Yep. They're like, no, no, we, we need more information. You need to tell us more. And the fact that Brock can't is, is, is you know, going to continue, I believe, the, the hold up for just a little while longer. But the fact that it took a year to get to this point is ridiculous. All right. One other point that I want to hit, and then we'll uh, go here so people can just read the magazine. You mentioned something here. And by the way, I heard Dave Prater say the same thing when they had an open media session at Supercross. He said, he's like, this might not be popular, but I think there might be a built-in bias because we're not seeing this happen in any other series except American Supercross. Uh, and you are saying the same thing. Like you're, you, you, are, you are pretty sure from the evidence you have that it seems like things are treated differently when there are penalties here. It is my personal opinion, yeah. yes. And wow. I'll give you a case, a case in point. At the Motocross of Nations, there were 90 riders in the race. The FIM decided to fuel test eight randomly. And of those eight, all three members of Team USA were tested. <laughs> and, and, and the AMA had, has long made a fuss of fuel because we use different fuel here and you know you remember ricky gate and chad reed and all those guys with the fuel testing back in you know the early part of uh, the millennium um now the 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 to have a one in nine hundred and fifty thousand chance to all three members of team usa have to get their fuel test at the motocross of nations that just seems like bias and 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 it goes way back roy jansen will tell you about all the years where we drew last in the <laughs> random lottery for gate picks at the Motocross of Nations. Yeah. You know, I, 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 it'd be hard to go back and prove that, but I think you can just look at uh, the way they've drug their feet on these AMA Supercross rider cases of the past few years, and at least you scratch your head thinking, wow, why are just these guys? You know, is, 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 there, is this not happening in any other series that the FIM is involved in? And if it is, why is no one talking about it? Right, right. Because unfortunately, I think, you know, the FIM sanctioned so much stuff to find any one person who covers all these series in depth to know all of these, de all of these details about drug testing and penalties is rare. But it appears as we unpack other series, they don't really have other examples of this happening in World Superbike or MotoGP or MXGP, like what happened with Stewart, for example. It appears like that's not happening every day in these other series, which is a little yeah. suspicious. Yep. And, 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 and like I said, that's my personal opinion. And, yeah. and if you read Rob Dingman's column in American Motorcyclist, it's his opinion, too. Uh, but, but he's helping to change that, and, and so is this new president. So I think better days are ahead. Um, and certainly uh, that, that day in court for Brock, is, it's almost upon us. All right. Well, everybody can read about that uh, in the magazine, which will be out tomorrow uh, for our new digital edition. Hey, by the way, what do you think of that? Like, love it. It's got to be. It. It's got to be amazing to see it this way. Yeah. <laughs> it's the first time I've actually read a magazine uh, on you know my phone or right. an iPad, and and, yeah. and I love it. It, it. it it's a it's a really neat experience, and uh, I'm I'm glad that we've got this up and running. And I think people really enjoy it. You know, the the newsstands are shrinking. That's you know. All you have to do is walk into a, uh, a Barnes & Noble, and you can see that, and, um, or a Walmart. Uh, people trying it, and uh, I'm stoked that we're breaking ground with this. All right, last thing, totally unrelated to the magazine. Dude, 12 125 races? I didn't even know that was coming. Just announced today. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's when that thing on Vital popped up, because we had a place saver on ProMotocross.com for uh, you know, what we were going to put here. Uh, I was like... I was bummed out because that's not the way it was going to be, and, and, and nor, nor did it read the way it was supposed to. And everyone's like, oh, you guys are just trying to kill it. No, we're trying to expand it. We're trying to make it as cool as can be. And, and I, I, you know, to, to have all 12 tracks on board, uh, guys like Villapoto and Sipes and um, you know, wanting to ride. You know, I've, I've been talking to Steve Lamps, and I think we're going to get them out for um, the, the, the Pala National. Nice. Um, that's, it's, it's, it's going to be fun stuff and it's going to be good. And, and yeah, we're, we're, we're excited about it. And I hope that, uh, that thing just keeps growing and, and everyone keeps having fun with it.
And there it is, the boss man, Davey Coombs. So check out uh, the Brock Tickle story for the latest on Tickle situation and also the incendiary comments from AMA uh, President Rob Digman and what he has to say about the FIM and how they've handled drug testing. Again, only in the new magazine, digital.racerxonline.com. Thanks to Yoshimura. Over six decades of four-stroke research and development for your bike or quad and street bikes, of course. Have you seen, like, the Suzuki Road Racing Team through the years? How dominant they've been. 2019 systems are shipping for all new models, including the KTM and Husqvarna brands. If you're serious, it's Yoshimura, and they've got a new website at yoshimura-rd.com. That's it. I've gone on long enough. Uh, Going to try to get one more pod in this week with one of the top riders in Monster Energy Supercross. And then, just like you, I will be watching those riders this weekend in Nashville. See you at the races. Thanks for listening.